All right, I'm ready. Okay, welcome, good afternoon, welcome to this talk. I'm going to talk about nasty things in parallel computing, things you don't want to do, but sometimes you have to. Now, my name is Ruth van der Pas. I work at Oracle in the Spark organization and typically looking at very large scale problems, both in terms of size of memory and threads. And what I'm eventually going to show you is a real world case that drove this entire talk. And um, I think we're going to have um, an extra giveaway for the most engaged participant in this talk. So I'm not talking about how many questions you ask because it's really as easy to ask many dumb questions. It's about how engaged you are. And that's highly subjective, I'm afraid. But <laughs> in the end, I'll need to make a decision who will, who will get the extra prize. Oh yeah. There's a little mini tutorial here I couldn't resist. If you have a question, we have very friendly booth staff here to help you out. But if it's more specific to OpenMP, we have on-site support as well. There's always one of us around. And here's your very friendly booth assistant to happily answer all the questions you may ever have about OpenMP. All right. Let's get started with the meat of the talk. What is a lock? The way I describe it, a lock is some sort of abstraction. So I call it something. And it's something that can be acquired by a thread. The key is while a thread has that lock, nobody else can get it. That's the, that's the thing. And actually how you implement it, that's not my concern. It's a, it's a, like I said, it's like an abstraction. So this allows a thread to do its work in private, not disturbed by any of the other threads. That's basically what it does. And when you're done, you're supposed to release the lock. If you don't do that, do that you have the famous deadlock. Everybody's waiting for you to release the lock. If you don't do that, no progress will be made. Oh, yeah. So in that way, you can do work on a protected region in your code where, where you don't want to have multiple threads do that do that work at the same time. All right. Here's a real world example. Everybody wants to steal from the cookie jar, all right? But while somebody is stealing a cookie trying to find the nicest one, nobody else is allowed to open the jar and get a cookie. All right. So how would you do that? Well, here's the code. The code here will, get some bookkeeping. Um, I have the openmp.h. So it knows about the special data type, and I have a variable called myLock that I here declare to be of the locking type. Again, how that's implemented is not my concern. Then in my program, I first have to initialize the lock. That's a one-time thing done in the serial mode. That declares the system to be a lock and actually sets up the data structures to handle the mechanics later on. So that's a mandatory call. If you don't have this, any other behavior is unspecified. So don't forget that. And before I forget to say, when you're done, you have to destroy the lock. If you don't do that, you'll probably get away with it, but I would recommend to include it in your code. All right. Then we have the parallel region. And as you know, all threads execute all the code in the parallel region. So they all call a thing called the cookie jar. All right. So here's the source code of the cookie jar. So one thread will get in, and actually now it will set the lock. That jar is mine now. And remember, nobody else can go in and try to do the same. If you do, you'll have to wait. You're going to wait to acquire that lock. Uh, while you have the lock, you grab your favorite cookie, and you're supposed to release the lock. That will give the next thread calling this function the same opportunity, one after the other. So that's by and large how a lock works. By the way, there are seats if you'd like to join. There's going to be a, um, a lucky draw for a copy of our new book. So if you leave your business card with us or join us, you'll make a chance for that. So why, why bother about locks? In OpenMP, it's typically implemented as a special variable with a special status and it lives somewhere in memory. 
You don't know where the lock is, and I'll get back to that very soon. The lock is a variable somewhere in your system in that shared memory. And in order to check whether the lock is available, it has to read the information. Now maybe you start seeing where I'm getting at. A read could potentially be expensive in a large system. Because the data has to travel to that thread wherever it's executing, so that single variable with the cache line containing it will have to travel all the way to the, to the thread. And that can take some time or a lot of time, and that will cost you performance. Another thing is with the lock, you tend to serialize the execution one at a time. And then each time you do that, you have to wait for that variable to be available. And if you're lucky, the, thread, the next thread is executing nearby. If you're not lucky, that thread is somewhere else in your system. And again, you have to have the data. So locks tend to be expensive. And that's what I just said. It serializes execution. As usual, the bigger the system, the worse it gets. But luckily, you'll see it on a small system too. So be aware, even if you're developing on a small system today, if you ever, your manager gets enough money and you get a bigger one, if it doesn't hurt you today, it will hurt you tomorrow. All right. So eventually a lock is going to destroy your scalability in many cases. Here's what I call the evil family member, and that's an atomic operation. And maybe a show of hands. Anybody here familiar? Who knows what the atomic operation is? In, no? All right. I'm going to explain it in some detail. All right. So an atomic operation can be applied to any integer variables. In some systems, you can have a floating point variable. But by and large, you do that on an integer variable. So here I have a variable, my counter. It's a global variable, therefore shared, initialized to 0. There's a steamboat roll, rolling in. All right. So, initialize to zero. Here's the parallel region. And in this very simple example, I use the atomic update to update this variable with one. So each, each time a thread will get in, it will add one to that value. Essentially, you're counting how many threads you have in your parallel region. That's what you do. All right. So, Behind the scenes, a lot of things are happening here. And the key, the key of an atomic operation, and this was introduced, I think, before the physicist found out there's more than an atom underneath. The idea of an atomic operation is that nobody else can interfere while you do the op atomic operation. So you work on the atomic operation. It's like a lock. Nobody else can get in and do the same. So again, you tend to serialize the computation. And what I'm now going to show you, and I, I bet you I'm probably the only one on this show floor showing to you some assembly language in the, in the booth, but that's what I'm going to do to show you how it really works under the hood. All right? So here's my function, my atomic add, and what it does, it takes a variable A and adds one to it in an atomic way. Let's say you want to write the source yourself which you shouldn't do because every function has atomic operations, but let's say you want to do that yourself. All right. And what I'm going to show you is non-existent assembly language, and I couldn't resist to call it fake assembly. So here's the code, and I'll, I'll kind of slowly guide you through it. Um, I load the address, the date at the address, that's my, my A, into a register. That's the first step. Then I have a loop. In that loop, I add one to that variable. That's this one. Okay. The thing is, I want to know if that operation succeeded in an atomic way. And for that, about all systems I know have an instruction called CAS, compare and swap. And how that works is best illustrated by the compare instruction next. If, if these two values are the same, it means the swap has, a, has succeeded and have interchanged the I have updated the value. It's not for the faint of heart. This is probably not the right place 
to talk about these details, but I wanted to show you how that works. So you do the instruction, the compare tells you whether it succeeded or not, because maybe somebody else was doing it. Remember, it's an atomic operation. So if this thread can't do it, it means somebody else was doing that operation, so you have to wait. And that's why there's a loop. You try and you try again. Now, the disclaimer is this is very naive. Usually, the, the, you don't try again immediately, you have a timeout. Because otherwise, you'll be hitting that cache line all the time. The other reason I wanted to show you the assembly, you see load instructions here. You actually have to load that data. And what I find to be the misconception is, is that people think this instruction is expensive. No, it's loading the data that will cost you. All right. All right. So why is it evil? And even despite the instruction level support, like has, it's it, the cost, most of the cost is in the data transfer. And again, as you scale up your machine, add threads, that becomes a worse and worse problem. All right. So eventually, just like a lock, an atomic operation will start dominating your scalability. So I have a case study to demonstrate this. This is from a real-world application, simplified, but it's what I found in a real code, and it's, it's, it drove me to actually give this talk. So let me go through it fairly slowly. There's an OpenMP parallel region. That's an integer variable i, but there's a while one loop. I always have some difficulty understanding that. While one means it will never end. But eventually, you'll see a break, so you'll jump out of it. Okay. I see some heads nodding, so I'm probably the only one struggling with that concept, but okay. So it's an infinite loop where eventually you jump out. So inside is an atomic update. Inside the parallel region, inside that while, is an atomic update, and it, it does an increment, and the capture says, keep the old value, because I need it. So you do two things at the same time. That's one of the more recent OpenMP constructs, to keep the old value and update the new one. So job counter is incremented. If this i exceeds some threshold, you're done. And this is all private to that thread executing inside the parallel region. Yeah. Once you have your value of i and you didn't break out, you do some work. So. I'm not in favor of asking questions to the audience, especially not on a noisy show floor, but why is this bad? And I'll answer my own question. Why is this bad? This one, how often will this be executed? Many, many times, as much there's work for that thread. This is like a work queuing system. That's basically what it does. It gets some work, do it, gets the next portion of work. And that's in a very naive way implemented here. So not only is the lock or the atomic, I should say, executed each for each thread, it's executed many, many times for each thread. That's not a good idea. I looked at this code and actually took me a little bit too long to realize, gee, this is just a loop. This is just a for loop. All right? It was done for load balancing in this way if, if a thread needs more time it won't block the other threads. But again, bad for scalability. And when you look at it long enough, you can see it's a loop. So here's what I came up with. I can pre-compute how much work is being done. So I have some bookkeeping, how many threads do I have, how much work is there to be done, and how much work am I going to assign to each thread. Uh, that's not difficult. You're just a little nasty bookkeeping, but you get it right eventually. And then you figure that out. And once, once you have that, you start filling an array that for each thread will tell you how much work needs to be done. So statically, I pre-compute how much work I'm going to give to each thread. So what I lose is my load balancing handling. If there's a load imbalance, I'm, I'm sort of stuck. And there is a load imbalance here. The question is, what will win? the cost of giving up the nice load imbalance handling or getting rid of the lock? Well, I know the answer and I'll show you. All right, so inside that parallel region, I still have a lock. 
when I assign the work, I still have to do a lock. Because a thread gets in, and it will just grab from the queue. Remember, I set up these arrays, it's like a queue. I have an index array that will give you the next portion of work, and I don't care which thread w does which port part of the work, as long as it gets work to be done. So this is a fairly dynamic assignment. Just pull your work from the queue. I need to lock it because of this one. I need to make sure that while this read is in progress, index work is not modified. I hope that's clear to, to you. Because that's the key part, that's why I do the locking. Once I know what needs to be done, I unset the lock and I can do my work. Okay? And the work part is simply a for loop where start and end are controlled by the thread because that was the work it just picked up. So I still have a lock, but only the number of times called the number of times that I have threads. No longer inside that while loop. That was the one killing me. All right. So it's not so good for load balancing, but it's much better for scalability. And I'll show you the, the results. I ran that on a, one of our servers, a Spark server running at 4 plus 4.1 gigahertz. It has a total of 256 cores, 2,048 threads in one system. It's a one single system. The machine had four terabyte of memory. I didn't go that far. I have two versions. The dynamic, that was with the while loop and all the atomic operations. And the static that uses that for loop. That's the second version that I showed. Here's the result. The result, I show the second per iteration. So like the speed. So lower is better as a function of the number of threads that I'm using. And I didn't use zero threads, I used one, that's a little glitch here, it's just one thread, all the way to all the threads in the system. The blue line is the good case, that's the static. The red one is the dynamic version. As you see, for up to 256 cores, and even beyond, like 384, there's no performance difference. This was on a 100 gigabyte size problem. So that was sort of a smallish for this kind of machine. Um, and what you're seeing is it starts taking, this is bad news. It gets slower and slower. That's what it says. It takes more time. And when you do an honest comparison, not here, this is not a fair comparison. When you look at the best score here and the best score here, you see it's more than two times faster, 2.3 times faster. So it's a trick worth doing. I want to see what happens on a larger problem size, because then there's more work per thread. Pretty similar. Now, we'll see. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. The, the question is, the question is, is it, it exactly starts changing when you have used all the cores in the system. So once you start oversubscribing, and yes, definitely. I haven't looked at that, why that is, but I don't think that's coincidence. So there could be some cache line behavior because this is basically cache line behavior getting me. Yeah, very good observation. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's the, 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 the comment is it's probably the thread, it's holding the lock, it's holding the cache line, and then it has to go out for the other thread to come in, and then you start all over again. So, yeah, so it's definitely, I suspect it's something related to that, yes. So when we do the comparison here, we see you lose, it's not no longer 2.3 because you got more work per thread, so the cost is less. But we're talking about half a terabyte size problem. So you've got to have really large problems to make this go away. Probably petabyte or whatever. So, all right. Now, here's the cliffhanger. This is audi audience participation time. Anybody dare to 
suggest what would be a nice way to deal with the load balancing issue that I gave up. I gave up the dealing of load balancing. Is there possibly a way to deal with it? Anybody there to suggest? Now, all right, well, that's why you need to buy the book because it's the new task loop construct in OpenMP. Um, the task loop actually is very nice. I like it very much. It's a loop, but underneath it uses tasking. And you can get more control about load balancing inside the loop with that. You get some extra clauses to specify. It's a very powerful construct. Unfortunately, I did not have time to really try it. <laughs> uh, maybe next year, Supercomputing 18. And that concludes my presentation. To summarize, the way I see locks in atomics, they're like gold coins. You like to have them, but you don't want to use them. So that finishes it. And remember, if somebody tells you OpenMP does not scale, you should say bad OpenMP does not scale. And that finishes my talk. And thank you very much. Any questions? Oh. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah.